Hello squad and welcome to the start of the next topic in European history that we're covering which is the 20th century in crisis the rise of totalitarian dictators and how that leads to World War II and then of course brings us into the Cold War after that so our last two major topics that we'll be covering here in the history of Western civilization so we'll start today by looking at the rise of totalitarian dictators in general with Mussolini being one of those in particular and then later we're going to take a look at Stalin and then after that Adolf Hitler and we'll take each one individually at that point and then see how they come together as a confluence for World War II. So as we take a look at just this first screen you can see some of the things that are drawing people toward totalitarian dictators in post-war Europe. After World War I, uh, it was a, a cataclysmic disaster that happened in World War I. It was a war that solved very little and actually um, just caused the next war, created the next conflict. So during this 20-year truce that we see happening, we'll see the rise of radical regimes, uh, partly as the result of the war. Like, for instance, with World War I, you can see Joe Stalin here um, that is going to become the dictator of the Soviet Union after the death of Vladimir Lenin and the expulsion of Trotsky and the other Trotskyists. Uh, from the old guard or the old party uh, and you can see Stalin looking so benevolent here carrying a baby and yes the kind of thing that a mass murdering lunatic does all the time right well we'll, we'll see and then here we see the Italian black shirts this is the children's brigade of the Italian black shirts as a defense kind of thing to defend Italy against the problems that they see all around them defendilo here we have this little poor baby with fiery hair why does he have fiery hair his hair is on fire here because of Bolshevism, Judaism, and another scary hand. It's, uh, you know, the threats to Italy that we see happening at this time that are scaring people into voting for these tyrannical dictators, these tyrants. Now, dictators are nothing new to European history, of course. We've seen what's called the old dictatorship, and then today we'll look at what the new dictatorship entails. So first of all, old dictatorship uh, tends to be what we would call the absolutist monarchies of the 17th century through the 20th century. Now, the characteristics of an absolutist state or an old dictator, uh, dictator state, you can see an example here with uh, Frederick the Great of Prussia. He is not a Nazi, and yet he gives us the foundation for the way that many of the Nazis see as an idealistic form of rule, but they want to take it a step further because the characteristics of the absolutist state, you have um, control over the country, but it's pretty limited because really what they can control is the army, the bureaucracy, the laws, and the taxes, okay? And so... The these are things that they have control over, but they don't control your daily lives. Sometimes they have control over religion, but then even it's uh, also pretty limited because people are secretively participating in other faiths if they want to. There's very little participation required of the people themselves other than to pay your taxes, uh, be passively obedient, meaning you don't throw mud at the, the ruler when he passes by in his carriage, or providing your body as a recruit for the army if you lose in the lottery or you get Dragoons. Okay, so th this is the goal of an absolute estate to simply maintain control uh, and to promote enough peace so that they can exist in, in a tough neighborhood. Okay, and then win their wars when they happen. So that's the goal of the absolutist state, but things are dramatically different under the totalitarian states of the 20th century. Here's a little video to give you an indication as to how.
intense, am I right? So, I mean, the uh, rise of the 20th century new dictators takes everything a step further. So they build on what was there before in European history, building up to this moment, and then add to it with, because of technological advances that are made possible during and after World War One. So the question is, is Europe in the 20th century ripe for dictatorships? And I would say yes, in many ways. You might recall that during World War I, Woodrow Wilson said that the reason the United States was going to war was in order to make the world safe for democracy. And so after the war, they gave the gift of democracy to all of Europe. I mean, Germany being one of those countries that had their Kaiserreich destroyed and then uh, replaced by a republic, in this case, the Weimar Republic. And then uh, much of Southeastern Europe as well was given this gift of democracy. But democracy comes with its growing pains. And as these new countries are being formed, um, there's a lot of inexperience dealing with this issue of democracy. And so a lot of questions as to who should run this country. And so ironically, this gift of democracy means that totalitarian dictators are more likely to happen because that's who people vote for during times of crisis, which we'll see many times of crisis at this point, especially because there's a lot of ethnic conflict going on. It's not just Germans who feel that they are um, uh, uh, superhumans or uh, Ubermensha who are fighting against the Untermensha, the subhumans, um, but it's, it's all over Europe. It's all of this conflict that was honestly kept in check by the fact that we had absolutist dictators before and now that the cat's been let out of the bag and everybody's got a vote everybody's competing for uh making sure that their ethnic minority is is either protected or or that you're blaming those ethnic minorities and scapegoating them for the problems that you see happening in your country one of those big problems of course is the great depression america is not the only one hit by a great depression but everybody else that's a major nation at this time germany especially hit hard by the Great Depression. Who do we blame for that? Ethnic minorities, like Jews, for instance, or uh, the Treaty of Versailles, or you name it. There's so many issues right now that are making this a very difficult system to, to maintain. And so uh, the totalitarian state comes out of the vestiges of the problems of the uh, early part of this century. Now, it goes back even further, though, because many of these totalitarian dictators will be reading through their history, and uh, they'll be looking at the reign of terror during the French Revolution and saying that the mobilization of the state into a total war effort was effective. It helped France to win their wars. Uh, the use of a great terror to destroy political adversaries and uh, maintain the supremacy of the state temporarily worked. It backfired in the end, but it temporarily worked. So if you could turn that reign of terror into a constant thing, this could establish your government in power and keep your government in power. Another thing, too, is during total war, during World War I, that was the sort of thing that mobilized uh, the working classes, the middle classes, unified them in a singular effort to be able to fight for something. And they had an enemy that they could blame for all their problems and an enemy to fight against with their industry, with everything that they're doing. And so there's very little room for things like class conflict or very little room for things like criticism of the government because you can make that illegal during a time of war. So the total war effort, another very valuable lesson that the totalitarians will take. And finally, under Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks, war communism did a, a huge, or served a huge lesson here to the rest of Europe as guys like Hitler who say that they want to fight against communism uh, are also borrowing all of the techniques that Lenin used during war communism and saying we should do something like that but change the name so that people don't think that we're Bolsheviks. But we'll do the same kind of thing. So these are the lessons in European history that are bringing about the characteristics of these totalitarian dictatorships. Let's look, a, look at a few of those different characteristics. For instance, we have total control socially, politically, economically within not only the state, which is something that we might have seen to a limited extent under dictators in the past, but also in individual lives individual personal freedom taken, freedom of religion, freedom of press, all of those things have been dabbled with removing uh, under dictators, but it was far more limited than what now they're able to do. And the, the reason they're able to do that in the 20th century so much more effectively is because of technology. Things like the radio, things like mass propaganda and the press make it so much easier to eliminate neutral actions and beliefs, making it so that you constantly feel as though you are being watched. And in many ways you are because of listening devices and use of secret police within your country. It makes it so that the individual is always kept subordinate to the state. 
Totalitarians are going to be fond of a saying that you can find individuality in the quotient of one million divided by one million, which is one. Okay, you are a single cell in the organism of the state. Okay, when I pluck a hair from my head, uh, thank God that was a gray one, but when I pluck a hair from my head, I don't weep over that poor little hair, let alone the tiny little cells that made up that hair. When I clip my nails, I'm not <laughs> crying because those poor cells. No, they're expendable. All right, cells are expendable. We'll grow new ones later. These will grow back. This will grow back, although hopefully it's brown and not gray this time. But the point is, cells are expendable. You are, as an individual, are a cell. You're expendable, and we can grow more. All right, the state is superior in all ways. One way in which to always let the individual know that they are subordinate, that they're always outnumbered, is through mass participation, whether it be rallies or through propaganda. Another thing, too, is when you are seen as an outlier, when you're seen as a minority that is on the fringes of this uh, social contract, you've got the secret police and, and periodic or constant reign of terror in order to keep the people that think they're individuals in check. So in Italy, it's the black shirts. In Germany, it's the Geheimnisstaatspolizei or the Gestapo, which is the acronym for the secret state police of Germany. And um, in, in Russia, it's the Cheka. So you've always got these as a method of keeping people uh, within the Czech. Of, of the government. And then there's continual mobilization. All right, if you look at the Nazi swastika, for instance, the fact that it's on an, on an angle most of the time and leaning this direction is because the swastika is implying that we are always on the move. There's always a goal that we are striving towards, always an enemy that needs to be defeated or destroyed. And that is one of the key characteristics of these totalitarian states. And if you look at the time period, I mean, it's so easy for us today to look back at this and to judge hard harshly the people that live through these time periods and say, you know, how could they? How could they participate in such a system? But I would argue that it's quite easy to fall prey to this kind of thing. I mean, if you look at modern political rallies today, whether it, it doesn't matter which candidate it is, okay, it doesn't matter. But if you look at modern political rallies today, it's so much of the same stuff where it's mass appeal, it's constant sound bites and slogans that are reused over and over again, whether that's make America great or forward or hope or change, doesn't matter. They're going to use the same crap over and over again to make you think that they've got the promises that you want to hear and then to get sucked into it. When you're at a mass rally, I mean, it's like everybody is participating. You're caught up in the moment. It's hard to resist that kind of thing. And so I'm, I want us to look at the quote from Alexis de Tocqueville, who is a French diplomat who came over to the United States. He was observing things in the U.S. and wrote a very famous book about it with a warning to the future. So in his book, Democracy in America, he said, no man can struggle with advantage against the spirit of his age and country. And however powerful a man may be, it is hard for him to make his contemporaries share feelings and ideas which run counter to the general run of their hopes and desires. Amen to that, Alexis de Tocqueville. It makes perfect sense to view, view this situation and say, you know, if I were a person living at this time, it would be easy for me to be one of these people who are caught up in the moment, caught up in the moment and, and saying, yeah, answer my, my prayers, to, you know, fix the problems of society for me. I can't trust any other government to do it for me. I want you to have all the answers. And so giving their freedoms to the government is something that can come so naturally to uh, human nature itself. Now, I mean, honestly, it's tough out there for the badass. If you want to be the historical badass, it's not easy to do. Uh, as you can see with this glorious figure right here in German history. Uh, all right, so this is an iconic photo of civil disobedience. This man who's standing at a 1936 Hamburg rally, uh, Nazi rally, refuses to give the Nazi salute. And his name was August Lahnmesser. And August Lahnmesser joined the Nazi party in 1931 in hopes of gaining employment. And he was a member until 19. 35 when he was expelled for marrying a Jewish woman named Irma Eckler. Lahnmesser had two daughters with Eckler and it cost him jail time. He actually had to spend time in jail for what the Germans called Rassenschande or dishonoring his race. And 
uh, Lon Messer here is uh, refusing to give the salute, and he'll get turned in for it later as well. And Lon Messer is believed to have served prison time from 1938 to 1941. In 1941, they let Auguste Lon Messer out of jail uh, because they were so desperate for men to fight in the army over in Russia that they let him out. And uh, he is presumed to have died in the war because he disappeared after that. Um, and his wife served a similar fate, or uh, had a similar fate. Because of her Jewish heritage, she was uh, taken by the Gestapo and she was put into prison and then um, is uh, presumed to have been, been killed there as well because there's no indication that she was sent to a death camp but she did die presumably during the war. So the point that I'm getting at here is it is tough being a historical badass. I mean you try and be that person that resists and this is the fate potentially, right? Well let's take a look at the early 20th century political spectrum. Now these are just a set of ideals that these totalitarian dictators had and you can see that uh, our own political system gets drawn into this a little bit as well. Today if you're a moderate you're considered to be in the middle on things. If you are a conservative Typically, you lean Republican then, and if you're a super conservative, you start getting out here into the fringes a little bit more. Um, and then if you're a liberal, you'd be a Democrat in America. And if you're super liberal, you're like leaning out here towards Bernie land and that kind of thing. But um, this is kind of the area of, I would call it normalcy. This is normal politics. However, it starts to get extreme once you get out to the radical left or the radical right, which is what happens because of the problems of the 20th century. Um, when we are leading into the Great Depression and after the World War, after World War One, so uh, for, on the radical left, we'll start with them. That's more of what you'd call communism or Bolshevism, radical socialism. Um, so the U the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, also known as the USSR or the Soviet Union. Again, that name is the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. This at the time was led by Joseph Stalin after the uh, death of Vladimir Lenin and the expulsion of Leon Trotsky. So Joseph Stalin. Stalin and his ideals, if you're communist, would be something along the lines of having no private property because it breeds class conflict and it's anti-Marxist. Another thing too is that you would ideally have a classless society in which uh, everyone is egalitarian, everyone is equal. Another thing that you would ideally have is that it is positive for all human beings. Everybody works, everybody benefits, everybody is taken care of with their basic needs. Now of course, these are ideals, and fact is that if you live under the shadow of that caterpillar mustache, um, you're probably going to die, okay? It's not pleasant. It's, it's anything but those things that we see of the ideals. But again, that's what they say of themselves. All right, another thing that we see on the radical conservative, radical right, is Nazism and fascism. Fascism is a specifically Italian idea. Nazism is a specifically German idea, and these are ideas that uh, are created by by the dictators that you see there with um, Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler. And these guys are bred for this kind of thing in the post-war world. They're, they're created by World War I and they they take the problems of the post-war world and say how, we, to, how to deal with these things is through having private property, protecting private property at all costs from people like Joe Stalin, and then having a class society because uh, the natural order of things is to have a regimented hierarchical system in which those who fought, those who serve, you know, that's where you stay in, in society and you're meant to be there. All right. And then there's also the idea that you're always destroying your enemies. So the Nazi swastika, again, is a good indication of that because if you invert that symbol, it's actually a, an ancient symbol for peace. But if you invert it as the mirror image, it's a, a new symbol for war. Constant conflict against enemies and destruction of your enemies is the ideal. But if you take a look at their actual methods, okay, if we look at the methods of these men, they're all so dang similar, okay? Really what happens is the reality of this thing, because of the methodology that they're using and the tactics that they're using, they claim they're totally different from one another, but in reality, they're, they're quite the same. They're both advocating for total control. That's a little thing that we call totalitarianism. The definition for that is that the state is all. 
The state controls all. There are secret state police and terror that is used constantly. Propaganda is constantly ever present in society to convince the individual within the society that they are not an individual, that the state reigns supreme, and that all rights must be given over to the supreme leader. Okay, and so we start to see this developing uh, throughout Europe at this time. But again, let's look at some of these characteristics and methods of fascism first. Okay, so fascism is anti Bolshevik. Uh, Bolshevik meaning that, you know, it's against uh, the Bolshevik workers parties that want to uh, take ownership of the means of production. You can see some of their, their propaganda here that is being used to convince people of the necessity of fascism. For instance, this one, this um, poster says Bolshevism without a mask. And so it is arguing that if you remove the mask of the Bolsheviks, what do we have left? We have war, we have destruction, and we have Judaism. And um, so they are going to spread it all over the world. So according to the fascists, you must get rid of it. Another thing that they plan to do in order to um, end the Bolshevik threat is to create a constant total war economy without actually calling it Bolshevik or socialist or communist. Instead, they're going to have uh, what's called autarky. Autarky is basically where just like in a total war economy, you have the government which tells businesses, private corporations, we want this product, we want this much of it, and you have to make it by this date, and then we pay you for it, and you pay your workers for it. So autarky is another thing called corporatism, where corporations and the government work hand in hand to make these things happen. Is it kind of like socialism? Sort of. But at the same time, um, it's government control, but at the same time, it is a, an independent uh, a corporation that's helping to do this. And and then, of course, if they don't do it, they get shut down. So uh, you, you have to do it. So is it that different from Bolshevism or communism? Really? No, it's not that different. But at the same time, they claim it is. All right, another thing, too, is it is violent and militaristic. The fascists are willing to use violence to get things done. That's how we solve our problems. In Italy, they'll have their black shirts. In Germany, they will have the brown shirts called the SA or the Sturmeiptelung, which means stormtroopers. They'll also have their Schutzstaffel or SS, which are are their elite guardsmen and then of course of course the uh, Geheimnisstaatspolizei the Gestapo in Germany as well using violence in order to get their things done in ironically this is an anti-democratic movement and yet at the same time they require democracy in order to get elected to power I mean Mussolini did not seize control militaristically he gained power because the people popularly elected him to become prime minister and then he will take over control of the government from there same thing with Hitler he popularly will rise through the system become the chancellor of the Reichstag uh, through the vote and then after achieving a 49 percent near majority in Germany they're going to take that as close enough and then take over the government through uh, various methods that we'll see later okay so it's anti-democratic and yet it requires democracy to get stuff done a good symbol of that um, for the fascists is uh, a the ancient Roman symbol of the fascissimo uh, so the fascissimo has the idea of the bundle of sticks now the bundle of sticks are strong and they have strength in unity and then they have this acts that is representing the power of the state or the uh, destructive capability of the state to bring swift and deadly justice if necessary. So the uh, same thing with the fascist salute. Okay, I'm not going to do it on camera, uh, but the uh, fascist salute, as you recall, is the arm outstretched straight away. That is the, uh, the fascist salute that actually comes from Italy. The Italians did the same thing, and then Caesar, as he was getting this, would do his um, somewhat goofy uh, receiving end of that. That salutes not this but it's this and as he is being saluted the idea is the more arms that we see the more unity we have a single arm or a single stick is easily broken but if you've got a bundle of sticks multiple sticks you've got the slapping power of the state and the unity of the people and so this is going back to the idea of a messianic leader I love this little uh, goofy poster here. Okay, we've got Mussolini's head photoshopped onto the body of the people. This is going back to that ideal of the Leviathan, how the state will represent the will of the people and take care of the will of the people. You see, Saluto al Duce, and Mussolini's nickname was El Duce, or el, the leader. And here you see him taming a lion, because why not keep a lion as a pet? I mean, he's a tiger king. This is, you know, the idea that they will save you because of their leadership, just like a Messiah saves you, not through sacrifice in their case, 
the way that Christ died on the cross for us. But through, uh, through taking on all of the needs of the people and addressing those needs by destroying our enemies. Okay, there's this emphasis on blood and soil. Of course, for the, uh, the Germans, that's going to be Aryan blood and Volk blood as being the ideal people and soil being the Lebensraum or the living space that is out there in Eastern Europe that they must achieve through warfare. And so you have all these idealized versions of what a, a, a good German person must be. Same, I mean, the Italians did the same thing. Uh, Stalin, in a way, did that as well. It's just they kind of changed things around to be less about blood and more about worker unity and the Soviet. But it's the same kind of concept, right? And so then we also have hyper-nationalism, again, with mass propaganda, mass appeal. And then um, mass rallies like the Nuremberg rally that we'll talk about a little bit later. And I'll have you see some scenes from um, Triumph of the Will, which is the ultimate piece of propaganda in world history. And it's all done at the 1934 Nuremberg rally. And it's just crazy to see how many people are there and how excited they are to see Hitler speak and the way in which they popularize it through the media, the way in which the Hitler youth are brought into this thing as, as participants. I mean, there were something... There were something like 300,000 people in Nuremberg just for that one week of rallies, and a lot of them children from the Hitler Youth. The fascists are also going to be quite good at mass appeal through demagoguery. Demagoguery, you may recall, it, the definition for that is that it is using um, fear tactics to get what you want in politics, to say that the enemy is out there and I have all the answers on how to fix those problems, on how to fix the Great Depression, for instance, and make everything all better for you. For instance, from this poster from the Nazis, on the top line it says, before unemployment, hopelessness, desolation, strikes, lockouts, today, work, joy, discipline, camaraderie, Give the Fuhrer your vote. Here we see a poster of a Jewish man, Der Jude, or the Jew, who is behind the curtain. And so this is actually called Behind the Enemy Powers. They're arguing that the people that are causing the war for us in World War II, if you're in Germany, is Jews who are controlling the international community. Stupid. And then here we see Es lebe Deutschland. Long live Germany. And you've got this classic poster, this uh, poster of, of Hitler wearing the SA uniform, and there he is with his goofy, ridiculous mustache, and then here you've got the people, and not a single one of them appears to be an individual. They all look the same, don't they? Because there is no individuality. And here we have the Rhine, which is the river of Germany that separates them from their arch nemesis, France. And it's a throwback to the messianic principle of Jesus being baptized in the River Jordan. Instead, it's Hitler being baptized in the River Rhine, by his followers carrying what's called the Blutfahne or the blood flag of the Nazis. And uh, instead of a beautiful dove coming down, um, like we did, like we saw with Jesus, where a dove floats down and the voice of God says, This is my son. Listen to him. Instead, we have uh, a scary Prussian eagle that's like flying down and, ah, ah, and all of these people that are are celebrating Hitler, you know, doing his thing. It's it's demagoguery. Okay, long live Germany because Hitler is in charge is the idea. Well, fascism again is a an idea that today we thankfully uh, are, are against. I would hope that we're against it, even though you see it again popping up in our own political system today, and you see it around the world popping up periodically, uh, even after World War II. But it was a very popular idea in Europe and in America as well in the 1920s and 30s. In fact, in the 1920s, um, the KKK, which is basically another fascist organization, hyper-nationalistic, you know, pure blood, Americanism, that kind of thing. Um, they were uh, the number, they were one of the fastest growing parties in America. There were four and a half million members. There were a lot of people there, but then it started to turn into an actual fascist movement as well. There was an American fascist party and they held um, massive rallies like Madison Square Garden was sold out. And what they did is they had a picture of George Washington on either side of a Nazi flag and an American flag and showing, uh, you know, we're all in favor of, of combining a hyper-nationalist idea of Nazi 
Nazi, of Nazism and fascism with patriotic Americanism. This is an idea that spread all over the world. Italy, of course, is going to be the first country to go completely fascist in, in the 1920s. Spain under Franco will do the same thing and his regime will last until the 1970s. Um, Portugal under Salazar, same thing. They will go fascist and remain that way into the 70s and I think even in the 80s. And then Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, all of these countries that were supposed to be democracies in the post-war war world, still going fascist. And then um, in the United States, as I mentioned, had parties. France had a fascist party. And um, Great Britain actually had all kinds of fascist uh, parades that were being staged all the way until right before the war started. Uh, after the Munich Conference in 1938, the fascist parties became increasingly less popular in Britain. But for a long time, they were having the same kind of success. And this is the kind of thing that's spreading all over Europe very, very rapidly. So Italy, of course, will be the first to have this take place. And the reason for that is because of the legacy of World War I. Italy during World War I was a part of the Allies, and what they were hoping to gain from the war was land on the Dalmatian coast. However, Woodrow Wilson at the Treaty of Versailles wanted everyone to know that this war was not for territorial gain. It was not for territorial ambition and nationalism. So they basically told Italy, sorry, you fought for that, but you're not getting any of it. We're creating this new country over there for Austria and Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. You don't get any of that land. So Italy's pissed. I mean, they saw this as a, a mutilated victory. Germany calls it a stabbing in the back. Well, Italy calls it a mutilated victory because they won the war, but they got nothing from it except inflation and uh, problems for their economy and absolute abject poverty. Okay, they had 500% inflation in their economy, which meant that prices were five times what they used to be. So your bread, five times what it used to be, your beer, you name it shoes. These things are so much more expensive and it also liquidates your savings account because you can't afford these things as easily. So how is Bolshevism a, uh, a threat? Well, uh, Bolshevism grows in communities that are facing issues like this with the economy, where there's rampant inflation, the government doesn't seem to have any answers. Bolshevism seems to have the answers for that. But it's definitely a threat to people that are, let's say, students, for instance. If you're a student in college, you're like, well, why am I paying to go to college when uh, Bolshevism is going to make everybody egalitarian and I'm going to get paid the same as you know so-and-so who didn't go to college? So it's a threat to students. It's also a threat to the middle class. It's a threat to business owners. It's a threat to people that are upper class as well because they're a target of the violence that happens. So Bolshevism certainly is a threat to the, econo the economy, to in human nature in many ways as well. So fascism claims at the time that they've got the answer. And then the guy that uh, that is going to turn this direction has kind of an ironic story. All right, so Benito Mussolini in the pre-World War I era, you can see him here with his, his mustache. Benito Mussolini, before World War I, was actually a socialist newspaper writer. He was a fan of socialism, thought that it had the answer to the working class's needs. But then World War I started and he became, became hyper-nationalistic and he actually signed up to be a sniper in World War One, And so then he went from um, being a, a uh, war hero to then right away after the war saying there needs to be a different plan here, a different program for stopping Bolshevism. If you think about what makes bo uh, fascism so appealing, it protects personal property, it protects your status, if you have status, if you're working class, uh, maybe not so much. But if you're a working class member, fascism also claims we're going to create the jobs that you need. So in many ways, it it finds a way to combine some of the better parts of Bolshevism while eliminating some of those threats. But then, of course, if you're one of those people that, you know, is fearful of hyper-nationalism or you're part of the minority group that doesn't want to get killed or you're Jewish or, you know, uh, it, it's not good. I'm not advocating for fascism. But if you look at what people at the time were thinking, many in Italy are starting to say, you know, Mussolini's got the ideas that I like. So Mussolini, here he is fist pumping to his uh, black shirt followers. Uh, the, the March of the Black Shirts is going to be this very um, uh, popular movement that'll take place in 1922. Uh, the fascists, the fascist party, had been gaining a lot of influence in um, the Italian uh, parliament at this time. Now there's a king by the na name of King Victor Emmanuel III Third, who can't seem to solve the economic woes and the violence that's taking place in the streets. So he sees Mussolini as a guy that should be the next prime minister. So after Mussolini becomes prime minister, 
through a popular vote and through the king's acceptance of this group, the fascists start saying, we need to solve the problems that Italy is facing. And their answer for that, of course, is to take over the government and invalidate any other parties. King Victor Emmanuel will stay the same position, but he's just a figurehead at that point. Mussolini says, I need emergency dictatorial powers to deal with the problems of the state. And again, he got voted up to this point, and now he's saying we will get rid of anybody that opposes us so that we can deal with the problems that are facing Italy right now. So the video that I'm about to show you makes it sound like um, Mussolini just kind of grabs power through a militaristic thing. It's not. It's really a propaganda appeal. You might recall from Italian history that in uh, the 1860s, Giuseppe Garibaldi had his March of the Thousand Red Shirts as he marched towards Rome in a symbolic gesture of how they're going to take over the state, but then he turned away. Well, Mussolini is going to harness his March of the Thousand Black Shirts as a propaganda appeal to that hypernationalism in Italy and say, look, this is how we're going to solve these problems. So as you saw, Mussolini in Italy and the fascists are going to take control of the state. Uh, King Victor Emmanuel III is going to sign off on these things because he sees them as having the answers that might be necessary. Socialism is uh, is is now made legal. Uh, people that are outspoken against the fascists are going to end up dead in the streets, just getting beaten up, sometimes in broad daylight. And so now Mussolini starts to take over through a series of reforms. So some of the positive things that he does is he's going to put the mafia in check. Okay, the mafia it was a problem for a while there and so instead of hanging out in Italy now they're all gonna go over to America just in time for prohibition they're gonna be like I'm checking out we'll go over here to America instead there's lots of business opportunities there as bootleggers thanks Mussolini but it's good for Italy I guess because now the mafia is no longer getting in the way as much another thing he's going to do is start a up uh, a campaign of propaganda called Mussolini builds and there's all kinds of I mean, I, I hate to say it, but it's kind of fun. It's kind of funny propaganda because Mussolini's an idiot, but at the same time, he's got some humorous work that he's doing here. There's all kinds of pictures of him, like, building things by hand, and he could build anything. There's nothing beyond his skills. And then you can see, again, Saluto al Duce, putting the government back on the move, putting Italy back on the move. You can see Italy is on the move, right? So Time Magazine is going to call him man of the year. So some examples of that through propaganda, we see in uh, the newspapers that Italy's newspapers were filled with pictures of Mussolini overawing visitors, captivating vast throngs, leaping hurdles on horseback, flying airplanes, because nothing can stop this man, and then harvesting grain by hand. What a man, right? No story was too silly, okay? Apparently, Il Duce recited entire cantos of Dante from memory. He worked all night. And you know what? The light for his office was always kept on. And you could see in the window that there was a figure sitting there. They had the dr shades drawn, but you could always see the shadow of a figure sitting at his desk, constantly working in Rome. And from the street, people would look up and be like, oh, Il Duce is working. It's two in the morning and on the Sunday and Il Duce is still working. Well, the reason that that was happening was because he had a sit-in and they would create a silhouetted figure sitting there to show that Il Duce is always working. Great propaganda, right? Another thing, too, is that he inspired philosophers and instructed economists. The American razor blades could not shave his beard because they were too weak. Only the Italian razor blades could handle this mustache. Mm -hmm. Slogans such as, the Duce is always right, and believe, obey, fight, soon covered walls all throughout Italy. I mean, this pumped up pro program gave people a confidence, a pumped up pride in their nation they hadn't seen in years. Even though all this stuff is going on, it's all uh, trumped up propaganda because Italian standard of living will actually fall during Mussolini's time in the 1920s and 30s. It will actually go down. Um, but at the same time, he is able to convince the world that what he's doing is right, and it's just, and it's uh, protecting Italy. And this is one of the key characteristics, once again, of the totalitarian state. So this is part one. We'll take a look at Joseph Stalin in our next video.